I'm more of a distributed system sort of guy. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is not really the real-time web. It is real-time, um, and it does exist on the internet, but it's not really the web per se. It's more of an architecture sort of thing. Um, and I'm the chief architect at Fastly. Uh, Fastly is a content delivery network specifically um, made to be real-time, in fact. Um, and what this talk is about is about the architecture decisions and the trade-offs that we made at Fastly um, in order to turn something that's not normally done in real time to something that is done in real time. Um, so to start out, real time has a pretty specific de definition in computer science. Um, and some of our systems could probably be defined that way as you know soft or firm, firm real time. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, as far as I see it, what we're really talking about, for the most part, is reducing latency, making things happen as quickly as possible, effectively instantaneously for our users. Uh, so when I say real time during this talk, that's actually what I mean. I mean minimizing latency. Uh, and when I say real world in the title of this talk, I mean it in two different ways. Uh, the first is that I'm lamenting the fact that many of the pieces of infrastructure that we use on a daily basis as part of the internet are not really meant for real-time systems. Um, so it's an unfortunate facts of life sort of real world. The other way is regarding the real world, as in the planet that we live on. Um, the planet that is large enough that it actually takes light a significant amount of time to travel across the surface. Um, the, this planet with all of its network issues caused by oceans, national boundaries, economic disparities, and intense storms. Um, but luckily, not all is lost. It turns out that on the internet, as it exists today, you can actually build real-time systems. Um, and, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> In terms of infrastructure and stability, the internet is a totally different place today than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Um, instead of 45 megabit backbones, we actually run something more like 40 and 100 gigabit backbones. Um, and instead of being oversubscribed, like the internet backbones were in the late 90s, um, major ISPs these days have terabits of excess capacity. In short, the internet is a more reliable and consistent place than it used to be, by far. How consistent is it? Well, I did a test by running a bunch of pings between one of our servers in San San Jose and one of our servers in Amsterdam. Uh, and here is an excerpt from that. You can see that most of the pings there are taking 155 milliseconds, um, or rather, all of the pings are taking 155 milliseconds. The difference between the slowest ping and the fastest ping in a you know, list of 306 packets is 300 microseconds. Um, you know, if you leave this up and running for long enough, you'll see outliers, but they are quite rare. And so, and also, of course, if you do this from your house, you know, the last mile still sucks. It's not going to be good. But the point is that once you get to a backbone, it's generally smooth sailing. And the nice thing is that this greater reliability and consistency changes the way that we can build systems. We still need to be prepared for failure, of course, but it changes the trade-offs that we can make. Um, and that is essentially what this talk is about. It's about the trade-offs that must be made in order to build a real-time system that spans the globe. Um, and the way I'd like to do that is by telling you about a system that we built at Fastly. Um, it's a system that we actually built three times, and in three entirely different ways. <laughs> um, so, what? Right. So before we get into that, I should probably give like a little backstory. Um, you probably need a little bit of background as to why the system I'm about to tell you about is at all interesting or useful. So when people think of CDNs, the word real time is rarely actually what they think of. You might think of like distributed or massive or pain in the ass, but certainly not real time. Um, I mean, what could be less real time than a giant monolithic system that like you have to spend tons of time updating and managing? Um, but it turns out that there's no reason a modern CDN can't be real time, and it can't provide most of its features in real time. Um, so that's what we set out to build at Fastly a couple years ago. Um, and what we do now is we do real-time configuration changes, we do real-time statistics, and we do real-time purging of content. And I'm going to focus on that last one, purging of content. So a CDN caches a website's content in servers all around the world, and then when you, something changes, you either wait for it to expire or you explicitly purge it. Uh, one of our tenets at Fastly is that we want to be able to cache anything, anything at all. Um, even things that change very frequently. So being able to remove content from all the servers around the world is really important to us. 
Uh, it lets people do things like cache user-generated content, cache APIs, cache whole pages, and so on and so forth. Um, and then when it changes, they just send a request to our purging system, and it's gone in about 150 milliseconds or so on average. There you go. Um, and the way they do that is just by sending a really simple request. Um, they, you know, just send a request that looks like a normal, you know, request for a piece of content, but instead of having a get, they just send a purge. And it gets picked up by our servers when we parse the HTTP, and we say, oh, they don't want to get this thing, they want to, like, get rid of it. And so then it gets passed on to the system that I'm about to tell you about. So we started off with a fairly naive solution to the problem and then iterated from there. Um, so let me tell you what this system looked like when we first started Fastly. So the first version of our purging system was actually written using uh, a piece of software called rsyslog. And if you're not familiar with rsyslog, it's entirely understandable. It's a piece of software that's typically used for streaming log messages from a bunch of different servers down to one server. Um, the thing is, it turns out that it's actually a pretty excellent message queue, kind of by accident. Um, and so here's how it works. We have a bunch of edge nodes spread around the world. You know, A might be in New Zealand there. Uh, F could be in Paris, for instance. Uh, a purge request comes into A. The purge could be for any particular piece of content. Um, that, what that does is then it forwards back to our central broker, uh, which is an RSS log broker, uh, which might be in, say, Washington, D.C., let's say. And then the broker deals with sending it to each of the edge nodes. It's a really, really simple system. We didn't actually need to write any software to get this working, which was awesome, um, especially because we only had a couple engineers at that point. <laughs> um, it also might look pretty familiar to you. You know, if you're actually working in a single data center, this might be the right answer for you. Um, but it turns out that for us, this has some problems. Um, so let's say A is in New Zealand, Z is in DC. The latency between them is about 230 milliseconds. What that means is that in the best case, the purge won't actually start propagating for 230 milliseconds after the user sends the request. Um, and then we have another problem. Our syslog is actually pretty cool. You get the option of how it's going to forward messages between its different pieces, between the different nodes. Um, you can choose TCP or UDP. And just for a little bit of background, just in case anyone forgets, TCP provides reliable, ordered, error check delivery of a stream. Whereas UDP does not guarantee order, and you can drop packets, but it does provide error checked, and there are datagrams. So, right. um, the problem is that neither of these protocols, as used by our syslog, is actually adequate for the problem. So when using UDP, our syslog messages are not actually guaranteed to arrive. Uh, the vast majority will actually get there, but the system losing messages just is not actually an option for us. So. That leaves us with TCP. Messages can be guaranteed to make their way around eventually. Um, the problem is what happens during packet loss events. Um, remember that TCP guarantees the packets will arrive in order. So what ends up happening is this. Let's say we're sending 1,000 messages per second between two nodes, one message every millisecond. And let's say the nodes that we're sending you know, to are about 200 milliseconds apart. That means that at any time, there are about 200 messages that are on the wire, that are not actually on one server or the other, but are actually in between there. So let's say a packet gets dropped at the very last hop before you get to the destination server. Instead of having a message, one message be delayed, what actually happens is the rest of the packets go through, but are buffered in the kernel at the destination server. They don't actually make it to your application layer yet. Instead, the destination server sends back a SAC packet, which means selective acknowledgement, um, which effectively says, hey, I got everything from packet number one to packet number 400, but I'm missing packet number, or rather packet number two to packet number 400, but I'm missing packet number one. Um, and while that's happening, the origin is still sending new data, and it's still being buffered in that kernel, not making its way through to your application. Then finally, the origin receives the SAC, realizes the packet was lost, retransmits it. And so what we end up having here is an extra 400 milliseconds of latency added to 600 messages. We ended up living with this for some time, um, but it was always with the knowledge that we could actually do something better. Um, and so eventually we hacked something together to replace this. 
which I referred to as love triangles. Um, and the reason it was love triangles is just because when I was writing it on the whiteboard, it like came out in this weird like heart shape, and I'm like, that's super awkward and weird. Anyway, so this system works entirely differently. Um, one of the very first goals was to not have to have a central server. Um, so this one is entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. And what we do is we define a graph of responsibility. Um, this defines which nodes are responsible for making sure that other nodes stay up to date. So in this case, A is responsible for both B and D. And then B is responsible for D and E, and so on and so forth. So in this system, a purge comes in to A, let's say, and A immediately forwards it to all the other servers via simple UDP messages. Each of the servers that receives the message then sends confirmations to the servers that are responsible for them. But really, what is more interesting is what happens when uh, a UDP message is lost. So in this case, E doesn't get it, let's say. Um, and, and what ends up happening here is that D and B, after a certain amount of time, will go, hey, I received a purge, but E, e never confirmed it. So we're going to start reminding them. Um, and what this is is kind of a really primitive form of something called uh, active anti-entropy, um, which is a mechanism that makes sure that like servers work together to actively stay up to uh, to actively stay up to date. So this system ran in production for a solid year and a half and was pretty good, but it does have some problems. It has three problems in particular that have bitten me over the past year and a half. One is unbounded latency. The messages, the, you know, the purges, the confirmations, the uh, reminders, they can all be lost because they're all done over UDP. Um, and during a packet loss event, this means that it's possible for a purge to take a very, very long time to propagate around the network. It will make it eventually, but, but who knows when. The next thing is that it's really difficult to know what the state of the system is because every node only knows a small portion of the global state, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep track of what's going on. We could introduce a central server to this in order to like, you know, have a source of truth, but that's something that we're trying to avoid. We don't really want central servers. Um, and then the, that initial step where the server that receives the purge sends it to every other server doesn't really scale. Um, the number of servers that we have deployed is always growing, and so waiting to send that purge out to every one of them is just not really an option as we continue to get bigger. We can do better than this. So, so Love Triangles was in production for a while. We decided to do something better. And so we know that TCP for sending the initial purges is out because of the potential delays. And we know that trying to handle consistency via UDP is also out because it's a pain in the ass. So why don't we build a hybrid? All right. So to start with, each of our data centers already has a switch that lives in it. The servers all live behind a particular switch. Um, and so we can do some interesting things with that because the switches actually let us run software on them. You can't run much code on them because they're you know, fairly small machines, but you can. Um, so yeah. So in this system, a purge comes in. Let's say it comes into Node F down here. Node F immediately forwards the request up to its switch. The switch knows where all the other switches live around the world, and it, again, sends them all out via UDP. Um, it's similar kind of how to like how the love triangle system worked initially, um, but it has much fewer messages because there are much fewer switches than there are servers. Each switch then sends out a multicast message within its own data center. Um, and what that, what that lets you do is with one message, you get to hit all of the servers that are under there in like one simple step. Um, and so up to this point, this entire system has done, been done using UDP. And here's where the hybrid part comes in. Each switch maintains a TCP connection to each other switch. Um, once the purge has been completed in its data center, the switch will notify all the other switches that the, uh, around the world that, you know, via these connections, that it has completed them. And so this ensures that if a UDP packet gets lost in that first step, that it will eventually actually happen. And so then, you know, once the, once the switch learns that, oh, I missed a particular purge, then it can do the multicast step by itself. So, you know, those TCP connections obviously still have the same potential problems as always. 
And backups can occur when there's packet loss. However, this all happens after that initial propagation step. And so it's not as big of a problem. So what this does is ensures the purges propagate as quickly and consistently as possible using UDP and make sure that the purges actually happen by using TCP. And then the other really nice thing about this is that each switch has a global state, has a global view of the world. And then as a bonus, we've also simplified the system. We don't have that like really complicated graph of responsibilities anymore. It's just a very simple list of switches that need to get a particular purge. So building real-time systems over the real-world internet is really an exercise in trade-offs. You really can't get everything you want. Um, but by knowing what you must have in your system and knowing what you're optimizing for and what tools you have at your disposal, you can really develop something that works excellently and you can actually build real-time systems over the live internet. And if you think those types of problems are interesting, you should drop me an email at jobs at Fastly. <laughs>